almost all of the peatlands in the country are damaged in one way or another and those in the peak districts are, are particularly damaged um, through past processes like industrial pollution killing off sphagnum mosses uh, lots of wildfires in the past my name's Joe Margetts. I'm a Senior Research and Monitoring Officer with Moors for the Future Partnership. And today we're at the Roaches. Um, this is a site in the southwest part of the Peak District. We've come to have a look at some of the damage that was caused by a wildfire back in 2018 and also talk about some of the conservation efforts that have been made to improve the condition of the site since then. When they become damaged and they lose vegetation cover, they dry out quite rapidly, they're prone to um, catching fire and if you think about peat it's like a fuel so high carbon content and it will burn so that can cause huge amounts of damage and that can lead to things like water flowing very quickly off the surface of the peat, increasing risk of flooding downstream, reducing the number of plant species um, and therefore the general biodiversity of the site it was quite a nice site before uh, the fire, so there was a fair bit of sphagnum moss on the site and cranberry, there was heather, uh, cotton grasses. Um, it was reasonably diverse for a moorland site in the Peak District. So doing something about that's really vital. So making the site wetter, I guess, is one of the key things that we want to do to um, in make it suitable for bog species, bog specialists, plants and insects but also um, protect that peat from future fires because if it's wet, it's a lot harder to, to burn. Behind where we are now, in the bottom of the bowl, there's quite a wet area. And as the fire went through, there was a little island left in the middle in the wettest area that didn't burn. So that was a clear indication of the kind of effect uh, that re-wetting that ground can have. Um, so that's something we're really looking to achieve, not just here, but across the peatlands and the peak district. Peatland moss um, came into existence as um, part of Micropropagation Services, which is the company that I uh, founded um, some 40 years ago. Um, we used to micropropagate all sorts of horticultural plants um, for the trade, and then we moved into propagating native species for peatland restoration uh, around 2000. Those were mostly for a couple of big projects, but um, we were then asked by Moors of the Future to do a lot of uh, development work, how to micropropagate uh, sphagnum. After some years of um, uh, trying to do that, we managed to develop a technique to produce tiny little sphagnum plants in a um, small gel bead which we um, were then able to distribute on the moors. That was reasonably successful, but the beads were quite intolerant of dry conditions, so the planting time was quite crucial, and they took a very long time to uh, establish and start to, to grow, although in the long run they, they were reasonably successful. Meanwhile, we developed speeder hummocks, which are small clumps of sphagnum grown in the glasshouse to um, five to 10 centimeters in length. And those proved very resilient when they were planted on the moors. So they became the standard planting technique for sphagnum on um, restored peatland. They need to be planted into some sort of vegetation, but given a little bit of protection, they're really very tolerant of conditions on moorland. Over the last few years, we've developed 
how we produce those hummocks and we got more efficient at it and the numbers that we're producing have now increased so we're, we're doing about six, six and a half million a year and ever increasing it seems. The starting point of the production process is to um, obtain very small quantities of sphagnum from a native site so that wherever we're wanting to replant sphagnum we'll, we'll take samples from that site of all the species that we can get and those will be brought into our laboratory, identified to ensure that they're the species we think they are and then we check them again, we have an external checking to make sure that we've got the right species. Those are then put into the biopropagation process and bulked up. That process takes uh, something like two years to get to um, bulk levels and then they can go into producing the beta hummocks in the glass house. Beta hummocks are then taken off the growing medium, rolled into little strips, um, um, rolled on um, uh, either paper, in, sometimes in plastic, but we prefer paper now because it's biodegradable. They're put in rolls of 20 and 20 rolls are put into a bag so that they can be easily carried onto the board. So there's been very many challenges in the, in the whole process. Um, initially trying to get this funny little very important plant that doesn't have any roots. It's a very small plant, very difficult to grow. To be able to propagate that in quantity quickly enough and efficiently enough so that it's an economic proposition is, has been really challenging. Our growing media, which is peat-free, it is made up of, of sphagnum with a little bit of composted bark in it to uh, give it a bit more structure. That, that, that growing media, after we've used it, because sphagnum doesn't have roots or anything, it, it's more or less the same as, as when we first mixed it. So we're able to collect that growing medium, sterilise it to ensure there's nothing untoward in it and uh, reuse it a number of times um, for future production. Sphagnum obviously requires rainwater for growth, so we harvest rainwater from the glasshouse roofs, collect that in large water tanks, filter it um, to, to make sure it's nice and clean before it's applied to the sphagnum um, as a mist for humidification and also for irrigation. Benefits um, of micropropagated sphagnum um, are the, 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 only, the only real alternative to um, our production method is to harvest from the wild. Obviously, harvesting from the wild can damage peat bogs that you're um, actually trying to restore if you're not very careful. And the, the micropropagated material is um, in a juvenile state. It's been cleaned up to ensure that there's nothing there that's harmful. Uh, the sphagnum, as a consequence of that, grows much more quickly, much more vigorous, establishes really well on the moor, and we're able to supply those hummocks and you have a pretty much guaranteed survival and rapid growth to restore the moors. We, we also propagate lots, lots of other moorland species, um, bilberries, crowberries, um, heathers, and also very importantly, cotton grass. Cotton grass is um, 
uh, very important, uh, particularly the, the common cotton grass, because it rhizomes very well and then holds the peat together. Those rhizomes in the propagation process can be individually separated and that's how we propagate it. We divide the little clumps of, of rhizomes up in individually to produce robust plugs of, of cotton grass for planting on the moor. That planting is normally done prior to the sphagnum planting because the sphagnum loves cotton grass as a, as a structure to grow up and to protect it in the wild. Although our business has expanded quite quickly over, over the last few years, we still see ourselves very much as a family business. We have families working for us. All our staff are relatively local. We have a, an ethos of sustainability and I think all our staff love that idea and that they're contributing in, in a small way to climate change benefits. I think sphagnum moss is the most important plant in the world. It absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere, um, locks it up, um, and provided the moors are in, kept intact, that um, CO2 as uh, a, a carbon is stored in the peat for millennium. I'm doing what I'm doing um, because of the importance to climate change. Um, I believe Sagan is the critical thing that I can make a contribution to climate change by producing. Um, I would say I would be retired now if um, it wasn't for Sagan Moss and the importance I attach to Sagan Moss and its propagation for restoring peatlands all over the all over Europe. So what we do is take one of those, we make a, a small hole with the dibber in the, in the peat here, and then we just put it in by hand, just pinch it in so it's there. We've done research into the different, into the different forms of sphagnum that you can, you can plant, looked at the various different ways of doing it. And certainly for where we work, with the kind of wind and the rain that you get up here, we found that the most likely to, to succeed and to survive is doing it by hand, which obviously takes a lot of time to do that. A lot of people are needed. As you can see, the plugs that come from the greenhouses at Biedermoss are um, all quite uniform green colour because of the very controlled conditions they've got there. But once they're planted and out in the field, the more characteristic colours of the sphagnum species start to show due to the different light levels and other conditions. So they're really quite beautiful um, once they start to, to show their um, natural forms. I think beyond all the ecosystem services we've talked about, so the wild fire prevention, the flood management, carbon capture, they've got a value in themselves, they're just magical places. And I think it's that thing that people in a way, because it's nature, they sort of forget what it used to be like. So maybe, you know, 20 years ago, some of these areas were, were so barren. You know, there was just whole hillsides of bare peat around the peat district. That now, there's, because they're seeing vegetation there, they, they kind of don't remember that it used to be like that. Just as the people before that used to think all Norland was just a kind of barren wasteland. Now people are seeing it for what it is, but it's also that recognition that it's something that needs to be protected.